So good morning, uh, good afternoon and good evening everyone. I'm really pleased to welcome you on this webinar on the uh, improved preeclampsia management with s fleet one PLGF ratio today. I'm really pleased to welcome our four speakers uh, today and you will see that we will have a very interesting session with clinical case, a real experience uh, from the routine. So let's uh, start. Uh, before we start with the first presentation, I would like to give you some housekeeping rules. Uh, so what you can see on your screen is that you have different uh, tools that uh, are available. You will see the slide in the main screen and here you will see the media player on the uh, top left uh, corner. So in this uh, media player uh, part, you will see the speaker which is uh, at the moment uh, presenting. Uh, whenever you would close any uh, window, you can always retrieve them from the panel at the bottom of the screen. And you can see that if you want to open the media player, you just have to click on the uh, orange button at the bottom of the screen. So uh, these slides are in the central uh, area. You can move uh, any way resized or closed um, the uh, windows at any time. Again, if you close, uh, you can retrieve the side area with the blue button on the uh, panel at the bottom of the, of the slide. Uh, so when you will, we, you would see some video during this presentation. So for the video, please uh, open the media player. They will uh, be uh, shown in this uh, media player. So again, if you um, have uh, not the media player open, you can uh, click on the icon uh, on the bottom of uh, your screen. At the end, we will have a Q&A session. So nevertheless, during all the sessions, you can uh, ask your question. So there is a Q&A session window, which is uh, here where you can type your question. And of course, we will try to cover them uh, during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So there is a possibility for our uh, Russian speaking uh, attendees to follow the presentation with simultaneous translation in Russian. So for this part, you have um, this uh, translation window um, uh, below the media player screen where you can choose the language. And of course, you can refer to the translation uh, widget file uh, uh, at the right corner uh, where you will get full instruction to be sure that uh, the simultaneous translation is working. Uh, so as other general recommendations, so for the best viewing experience, we really recommend to have a wired internet connection and to close any program or browser session running in the background that would cause issue. So the webinars are bandwidth uh, intensive. So if you can close any unnecessary browser tab, uh, it will help you to conserve your bandwidth. So the webcast is being streamed through your computer, so there is no dialing numbers. Uh, for the best audio cap quality, please make sure that your computer speakers or headset are turned on and that the volume is up so that you can hear the presenters. You can find additional answers to some common technical issue located in the help engagement tool at the bottom of your screen. Uh, as also a, remember, um, a reminder, so uh, in the lobby you had one uh, video that was running, so this was not the correct video, uh, and uh, so we are really sorry for that. So now let's uh, start, and uh, I would like to introduce our first speaker, 
today. So Martin Overgaard uh, old a joint position as biochemistry uh, at the Department of Clinical Biochemistry and Pharmacology from the Odense University Hospital in Denmark. And he is also associate professor at the Institute of Clinical Research at the University of Southern Denmark. So he obtained a PhD degree in biochemistry and molecular biology from uh, the University of Southern Denmark in 2008 and completed a five years training program as clinical biochemistry in 2016. So the main uh, research interest of Professor Overgaard is uh, the biomarker for endocrine disorders and pregnancy complications such as preeclampsia and gestational diabetes. So Martin Overgaard is using automated immunoassay as well as mass spec uh, targeted proteomics to measure proteins markers in routine and research setting. So uh, his peak would be around the implementation of SFID PRGF ratio in clinical routine. Uh, and I'm happy to hand over to Martin for the presentation. Thank you, Pascaline, um, for the nice introduction. And um, first of all, I would like to uh, thank Thermo Fisher Scientific for and Clinical Diagnostics for providing me the opportunity to give this talk at the webinar today. So uh, geographically, Odense, or Odense, as we call it, is located in the center island Fyn in Denmark, uh, as indicated uh, by a yellow smiley. So initially, I would like to declare that I have no conflict of interest related to this talk. So the work presented today is based on a strong collaboration between our central laboratory and department of obstetrics and gynecology that handle almost 5,000 births per year uh, in the region of Fyn. So um, my uh, talk today will cover our decision to implement SFLIP PLGF in preeclampsia diagnostics um, as well as implementation in the routine setting um, with the first routine analysis performed uh, in November 2017 <clears throat> as the first uh, laboratory um, in Denmark. And then finally, I will uh, talk about the predictive performance um, that we um, have investigated uh, in a retrospective study based on the first 18 months of clinical practice. So, preeclampsia is a major pregnancy complication and affects 5 to 7 percent of pregnancies with a wide variation across regions. And we know that the preeclampsia and eclampsia are among top three causes of maternal morbidity and mortality and accounts for 70,000 deaths per year, maternal deaths per year, and as much as half a million fetal deaths per year. Also, <clears throat> evidence has supported that preeclampsia, eclampsia predisposes to long-term CVD risk. So why are more diagnostic tools needed? Well, it's a challenging uh, task to diagnose preeclampsia and to predict from clinical symptoms alone because preeclampsia is a multifactorial and multi-symptomatic syndrome. And um, many uh, preeclampsia symptoms also occur in uncomplicated pregnancies. Um, accurate diagnostics um, potentially improve maternal and fetal outcomes and optimizes hospital resources. So as we know, preeclampsia usually begins after 20 weeks of pregnancy in women whose blood pressure had been normal uh, and is characterized by hypertension and signs of damage to other organ system, most often the liver uh, and kidneys. And the Danish uh, diagnostic criteria used uh, are based on international ISSHP criteria. So today, first trimester preeclampsia screening using biomarkers and maternal history in combination um, 
is performed in some countries uh, around the world. And in Denmark, it, um, there's been data collected to assess the performance of this early pregnancy screening regime as well. So um, based on the severity of preeclampsia, um, <clears throat> it's divided into early onset preeclampsia uh, and late onset preeclampsia after 34 weeks of gestation. Uh, with the uh, uh, more severe cases in early pregnancy and the more mild cases in late pregnancy. And the biochemical workout or the bi biochemical diagnostics include organ markers as well as angiogenic markers as we will uh, know more about today, the SFLT PLGF. So a vast amount of biomedical research has established that normal angiogenesis in placenta trophoblast cells is dependent on VEGFA and PLGF mediated stimulation through VEGF receptor tyrosine kinases. And so um, in, pre in uh, preeclampsia, there's um, a preeclampsia dependent increase in uh, the soluble uh, receptor SFLT1, which sequesters free angiogenic factors and thus impairs angiogenesis, leading to hypoxia and placental ischemia and endothelial dysfunction. So for implementation of SFLT um, <clears throat> PLGF uh, ratio at uh, Odense University Hospital, <clears throat> we performed um, a, technicolo uh, te uh, technolo technology assessment, <clears throat> medical technology assessment, which covers scientific evidence level economy and uh, implementation into na clinical, national clinical guidelines. And based on that, my department <clears throat> decided that we could start offering the test to our clinicians. Um, and then followed um, different um, uh, issues uh, concerning which platform to select, um, how to set up the validation which clinical cutoffs to use, and um, what would be most important, the rule out or rule in or both. And also, um, we had to make guidelines um, for implementation of this marker, <clears throat> as well as uh, teach our doctors, nurses, midwives, and lab techs uh, in order to, um, uh, to implement um, this. And so, um, uh, for the clinical management, um, the SFLT PLGF ratio is indicated for all acute and hospitalized patients uh, with uh, OPS PE and a gestational age below 37 weeks. The SFLT PLGF test is for prediction of preeclampsia within one week, <clears throat> and it's not for use as a diagnostic test. The split PLGF test is a supplement to clinical and paraclinical assessment of the patient, and it's not for patients already diagnosed PE. So among the instrument platforms available <clears throat> in our laboratory, we settled on the Brands Crypto platform. And that was based on the low volume ratio tests anticipated and the high analytical performance of the selected assays, including a wide assay range. <clears throat> so um, we obtain blood samples 24-7, uh, uh, and we run SFLT PLGF on serum. And then <clears throat> we perform daily analysis on weekdays, and we receive our samples um, from um, the maternity ward acute clinic the outpatient clinic and the labor ward. So our setup includes internal and external quality control. And for our external quality control, we use instant 625 preeclampsia marker. And here we noticed um, that the rush PLGF calibration uh, differ markedly um, from thermograms and Working Elma by uh, almost 50%, leading to lower ratios for rush uh, users. And um, 
this has been noticed in li the literature also. <clears throat> so in 2019, Stefan and co-workers stated that despite high correlation observed between the Alexis and crypto immunoassays, there were significant interassay differences between Alexis and crypto SVET PLGF1 ratio and PLGF. And this analysis demonstrate that SVET PLGF cutoffs validated with uh, Alexis immune assays are not transferable to crypto assays. Um, so to this end, we saw a need to perform a retrospective study of the SVET PLGF performance um, in the routine, in, in clinical routine. Um, and so um, this work was um, published recently, Open Access in Journal of American Heart Association. And um, <clears throat> within approximately 18 months, um, we included all women with suspected preeclampsia after 20 weeks gestation and a valid split PLDF ratio. And several um, were in, uh, excluded due to post uh, diagnosis sampling. 150 uh, women developed preeclampsia, whereas 351 did not. And again, we excluded those <clears throat> where the sample was taken more than four weeks before diagnosis. The women were divided according to gestational age and diagnosis. And uh, in the preeclampsia group, we saw um, a lower gestational age at delivery, lower birth weight, higher SGA frequency, and lower placental weight. Expectedly, s -flit one was threefold elevated in the preeclampsia group as compared to controls, whereas PLGF was 3.5-fold reduced, leading to a more than 10-fold increase in the s -flit PLGF ratio. In the receiver operating characteristic analysis, AUC rock for prediction of early onset preeclampsia within four weeks and one week was 0.95 and 0.98, um, respectively. And in the late onset preeclampsia group, um, prediction within four weeks and one week was 0.85 and 0.90, uh, respectively. Thus, the clinical performance of the S-Flit PLGF uh, in our routine setting is comparable with numerous earlier performance studies uh, in the literature. Next, we derived the single optimal um, threshold for all PE, which was uh, a ratio of 66. And then we compared uh, the performance to the prior proposed cutoffs for the Rush Alexis assay with a high sensitivity cutoff of uh, 33 and a high specificity cutoff of 85. As we um, see, a single cutoff of 66 provides a trade-off of sensitivity and specificity, but with a minor loss in the negative predictive value and almost optimal positive predictive value seen in both early onset and late onset preeclampsia. So even though we know that the risk is a continuum of the ratio, it may be easier for clinical decision making not to deal with a medium risk preeclampsia group uh, as suggested in earlier studies that is based on a high sensitivity cutoff and a high specificity cutoff depending on gestational age. So thus a ratio of above 66 indicates hospitalization or daily monitoring depending on clinical symptoms and paraclinic and the risk of PE within one week is high. And then again, in the low risk pregnancies, um, <clears throat> ratios below 66 monitoring will depend on symptoms 
and treatment can be ended, and there's a low risk of PE. Um, new clinical symptoms would indicate a ratio not before one week from the previous test. So we actually have a blockage, uh, so we cannot uh, retest uh, the same patient within seven days. And by that, um, I would uh, like to thank you for your attention. And the Q&A session will be after the last presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin, uh, for this very interesting uh, presentation and also this new concept of having uh, a single uh, cutoff instead of the multiple cutoffs that are now uh, proposed. And I think that this will be one topic to be discussed in the Q&A session um, afterwards. So thanks a lot uh, for this uh, very uh, interesting presentation. And now I, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the second speaker. So uh, Paul Gerby is the uh, head of the obstetric department in the uh, hospital of Toulouse in the south of France. Uh, this hospital is taking care of about more than 5,000 births per year. So Paul Gerby is specialized in the management and monitoring of high-risk pregnancy and really focus on preeclampsia because he completed a PhD on the pathophysiology of preeclampsia uh, with really a focus on the uh, involvement of oxidative stress in the pathophysiology of preeclampsia. He completed a postdoctoral fellowship in perinatal uh, epidemiology of the prediction and prevention of preeclampsia and other great obstetrical uh, syndrome in the team of Professor Emmanuel Bujol uh, from Canada. So currently he is associate professor and head of the obstetric department at the Toulouse University Hospital and is a member of the um, uh, Conseil National des Gynécologues et Obstétriciens Français and the Preclampsia Research Group, author of the National Guideline on the Management of Preclampsia. So I'm very happy to hand over to Paul for his presentation on the early onset. Thank you, Pascaline, for this nice introduction, and thank you to Thermo Fisher Scientific for the invitation and giving me the opportunity to present you our study in Toulouse, which were called Evaluation of the Pronostic Value of the Sphiltron PLGF Ratio in Early Onset Preeclampsia. You can find my disclosure, but uh, I have to admit that uh, I have no conflict of interest uh, in relation to this talk. So the incidence of preeclampsia fluctuates in France between 1 and 3%. It remains the fourth leading cause of maternal death and is also responsible for one third of very premature birth in France. As you know, the clinical presentation and evolution of preeclampsia are variable, concerning the timing of onset, the maternal severity, the speed of progression, and the fetal impact. So the sphilt one PLGF ratio got a high negative predictive value, as Martin told us, to exclude the diagnosis of preeclampsia if the ratio is under 38 but it also offers an interesting positive predictive value for the prognosis of preeclampsia. Some authors suggested that the sphilt one PLGF ratio of more than 85 could be predictive of adverse maternal fetal outcomes at two weeks in the population of suspected preeclampsia. While other authors shown that a ratio of more than 655 before 34 weeks of gestation could be highly predictive of preeclampsia with a necessity for fetal delivery within 48 hours. In this study, we evaluated the prognostic value of the sphilt one PLGF ratio for adverse maternal fetal outcomes in a population of women with proven preeclampsia be before 34 weeks of gestation. 
We wanted to study only the early onset rate of Asha as it corresponds to the population in which we try an expectant management. So we really need prognostic tools in this population. Other argument is that the ratio vary according to the gestational age, so we wanted to concentrate only in early onset preeclampsia. We also wanted to compare the prognostic performance of the ratio to standard clinical biological tools. This is a retrospective cohort study conducted in our hospital in Toulouse University Hospital, which, as Pascaline say, more than 5,000 births per year. We included all pregnant women admitted for preeclampsia before 34 weeks of gestation who had a blind split one PHGF ratio measurement. We excluded all women requiring a delivery within the first 24 hours as it corresponds uh, to patients who already had an adverse maternal alcohol fetal outcomes on admissions requiring the delivery and also multiple pregnancies. Adverse maternal outcomes were defined as the presence of disseminated intravascular coagulation, pulmonary edema, severe hypertension, placental abruption, seizure, head syndrome, cerebral edema or hemorrhage, or acute renal failure. Adverse fetal outcomes were defined as a fetal death or abdominal fetal, hate, fetal heart rate or Doppler ultrasound requiring urgent delivery. These criteria, previously studied, represent the usual indication for a iatrogenic delivery in the case of early onset preeclampsia with an attempted expanded management, as it is recommended in international guidelines. The sweet one and PLGF markers were determined using an automated immunofluorescence technique with the Thermo Fisher brand scripter kit. The tests were carried out by a staff blinding to medical data and pregnancy outcomes, and the ratio value was not known by the obstetrical team to make decisions concerning preeclampsia management. We, we developed rock curves to compare the predictive value of the ratio and that of the other clinical and biological variables usually used with the risk of adverse maternal outcomes. Survival curves for the risk of adverse maternal outcomes over time and the length of time between diagnosis of preeclampsia and delivery were performed using Kaplan-Meier method. Between October 2010 and November 2018, we included 109 pregnancies with early onset preeclampsia and a dosage of the split one PLGF ratio. The demographic, clinical, and biological characteristics on diagnosis of the global population and pregnancies with or without adverse outcomes are presented in this table. As you can see, gestational age at diagnosis was significantly lower in pregnancy with an adverse maternal outcomes. And the diastolic blood pressure and the sweet one PLGF ratio at diagnosis were higher in complicated pregnancies. And the main result is that the sweet one PLGF ratio had superior performance to all other parameters measured on admission, including uh, diastolic blood pressure, ALT, uric acid, etc. The area under the curve of the ratio was 0.82 and was significantly higher than other area under the curve or each individual parameters. The rock analysis suggested that a sweet corn PLGF cutoff of 293 would allow the maximum numbers of participants to be correctly classified with regard to adverse maternal fetal outcomes. This cutoff 
provided a sensitivity of 95% and a specificity of 50%, with a positive likelihood of 1.9 and a negative likelihood of 0.09. Uh, As you can see, the Sfilt-1 PLGF ratio was inversely correlated with the length of time between admission and delivery. The mean survival without delivery was 20 days when the ratio is less than 293, and only seven days when it's more than this cutoff. Overall, Pregnancy was ongoing within five days in 100% of women with a Sfilt-1 PLGF ratio under 293, compared with only 45% of women with a ratio of more than 293. At 15 days, 60% of women remain in pregnant in the group with a ratio under 293 compared to only 15% in the group over this cutoff. So this cutoff seems really interesting to separate two di really different groups for the prognostic of early onset preeclampsia in our population in Toulouse. So our main message are that the area under the curve of the sweet one PLGF ratio is one is 0.82, which is significantly higher than other an area under the curve or predictive value of standard clinical and biological tools that we use usually blood pressure, liver enzymes, uric acid, etc. Our cutoff value of 293 allows optimal classification of pregnancies and is statistically associated with the risk of adverse maternal outcomes and the length of time between the diagnosis of preeclampsia and birth. So the sweet one PLGF ratio is very useful in initial management. We, what's more interesting is the negative predictive value as with a ratio under 293 at presentation on admission, all pregnancies remain within the five first days. As Martin told just before me, our results are consistent with data from other previous large studies, which is really known, as RANA studies or the Gomez Ariaga studies. And the 85 cutoff is a really good predictor in a population of suspected preeclampsia. But this is really different when we concentrate on a population of proven preeclampsia and all the more in a population of early onset preeclampsia because this is a population in which we wanted to try an expectant management as it is recommended in all international guidelines. So in conclusion, the use of the sweet one PLGF ratio seems to be of interest as a pronostic tool to improve management of early onset preeclampsia. Our threshold in Toulouse of 293 enables the classification of women at the time of admission according to the risk of occurrence of an adverse maternal outcomes and the length of time between the diagnosis of preeclampsia and delivery. This ratio seems particularly useful for identifying low-risk preeclampsia and could perhaps eventually allow ambulatory monitoring of this case, it's just a hypothesis when the ratio seems to be in the lower spot. The result of our study obviously appear promising, but should be validated through international studies that include the value of the ratio in the decision-making progress to propose an individual management uh, of preeclampsia for each woman. 
thank you for your for your attention. Thank you, Paul, uh, for this uh, very uh, also interesting presentation. So here it was a kind of different setting, uh, more looking at the adverse outcome and preeclampsia with um, high risk. So comparing between low risk preeclampsia and high risk preeclampsia compared to the presentation from Martin. So I think it's uh, also uh, helping to understand uh, how we can use the ratio uh, also in different clinical setting. So thanks, thanks uh, for your presentation. And now I'm uh, going to introduce our third speaker, so Ignacio Eraiz. Um, so Ignacio is a medical doctor, has a degree in statistics in health science. Is a specialist in obstetric and gynecology at the FITA Medicine Unit in the University Hospital 12 de Octubre in Madrid, in Spain. Uh, he is um, associated, uh, pro associate professor of the Complutense University of Madrid he, and is a member of the research group of the Perinatal Medicine and the Research Institute IMAST 12. So Ignacio is the author of 66 articles in uh, MedLight journals and uh, have um, made more than 50 oral communication to an international congress, more than 100 lectures, one book and one preeclampsia monographs. Uh, so he is a principal researcher in two grants uh, supporting investigation project and uh, today is going to present uh, the head of uh, s fleet PLGF ratio in preeclampsia patient management on example of clinical case. Thank you very much, Pascaline, for your introduction. And also thank you to Thermo Fisher for the kind invitation to be here. And I would try to uh, illustrate what my uh, colleagues have talked about, the ratio and this cutoffs, how they can be used in the clinical practice and to illustrate this with some clinical cases. Here you have my, uh, my declaration of interest also. And uh, let's start with uh, the first case, before the first case, I would like to say that um, we have published that one in very interesting uh, application of the ratio is the revaluation of those women with persistent increased uh, resistance in the uterine arteries at 26 weeks. These are asymptomatic uh, patients, but they had a, at least a suspected preeclampsia because they had a very high uh, resistance in the uterine arteries. So we performed the ratio on this patient at about 26 weeks, where when the, the ratio between the SP1 and PLGF performs very well and it differentiates very well which patients are going to develop not only preeclampsia, because these markers are markers of placental dysfunction, not only preeclampsia, but also fetal road restriction from those that they are not going to develop them. So in those patients that we know that they have uh, high resistances in the uterine arteries, but most of them are not going to develop a preeclampsia or fetal road restriction, when we had a ratio, a normal ratio, uh, what we see is that at least from 26 weeks to 32 weeks, none of them are going to develop a preeclampsia or fetal road restriction. However, when uh, they had the ratio above the 95%, that is a ratio about 10. Uh, some of them start to develop uh, preclancy of fetal restriction, especially after 30 weeks. And when we cross um, the cutoff of 38, most of them develop, or uh, more, uh, practically all of them develop uh, uh, preclancy of fetal restriction. And then when we face to the ratio above 85 at 26 weeks, all of them develop not only a preeclampsia but all or fetal restriction, but also a preterm form of uh, these uh, entities. So um, you can see the protective uh, mm, value of the ratio when it's normal. And I would like to illustrate it with the following case. 
This is a 36 year old women without disease or, uh, interested, no smoker, very healthy woman. woman and uh, the problem is that two years ago she suffered a preeclampsia. This was an astrologist, and she was working in in a intensive uh, uh, unit, clinical unit, and she changed her role from doctor to patient because she started with uh, neurological symptoms with diplopia, cephalea, and dyspnea, and they had to uh, deliver her immediately at 29 weeks. Fortunately, the baby was okay. But uh, as you can imagine, in the next pregnancy, uh, she was w very worried about what could happen. So she came to us. We uh, calculate the risk for the first trimester uh, screening. And as you can see in the next video, hopefully, um, the uterine arteries were well, quite high, and um, we were worried about what could happen. We gave her aspirin, um, and we thought she could have an, uh, another preeclampsia and an next pregnancy. And when she faced, well, you can see here the how we measured the uterine arteries. They were quite high. Not extremely, but quite high. And when we performed the combined screening, the result was that she had a high risk. And she started with aspirin, that, as you know, is a very useful prophylactic treatment. So then she faced the, the weeks when she started to feel the, the first symptoms. And uh, we measured the, the split PLF ratio at about 25 weeks, and it was normal. The result was two, so we can reassure her that she was not going to develop a preeclampsia or fetal restriction in the next four or five weeks. And uh, we repeat the measurement at about 34 weeks, and it was also normal. And finally, she delivered normally at 39 weeks, and uh, everything was, was okay. And this is difficult to um, express this in a paper or investigation, but the reassurance that this patient had, how she lived her pregnancy much more relaxed when we told her that she was not going to repeat her complication, uh, it's really nice. And the negative predictive value of the ratio, I think it has the uh, very, it's very, very important. So the next case is also women without uh, remarkable medical history. I hope you are showing my slide. And um, again, high uterine arteries at 20 weeks, so we measure her uh, the ratio, and it was high. The baby had a normal weight. Uh, normal blood pressure, no proteinuria, but the ratio was 35. It's quite high, and especially PLGF was low. So we uh, reassessed these patients two week, and this patient two weeks later. The baby was, um, the growth was normal, but slightly uh, slow, and blood pressure normal, no proteinuria, but uh, the ratio was even higher, and the PLGF was uh, very low. So we decide, maybe you can criticize us, but we decide to um, indicate the corticoids. And in the next video, you can see the uterine arteries, they were not so high. Um, I don't know if you can see the video now. Hopefully it runs. And let's see now if it runs. Uterine artery were not so high. Uh, placenta was, was a little bit heterogeneous. Here you can see. And there was a zone, as you can see at the end of the video, that maybe there was some 
suspected zone that was not so attached to the mu neutrium, but uh, you know, this is a very specific finding. Of course, we educate the patient to be very careful if she had contractions, she should go to the emergency room. And this is what she did. Uh, at 30 weeks, she felt contractions and she came to the emergency room. Uh, the CTG was not completely reassuring, so my colleagues measured the ratio again, and it was very high, 422. And they, uh, they sent us to our uh, fetal medical unit. We performed a scan. And here you can see in the video the changes in the placenta. Let's wait a moment that the video runs. And you will see the differences. Placenta was full of a um, lot of coagulus, and we suspected an abruption. Hopefully, the video will run in a second. Now. It's quite spectacular. It's, you can see the difference in the placenta. Uh, and we could confirm we were very sure with this ratio and with this imagine that we were facing an abruptio. This was the vessel that was bleeding. And five minutes later, the baby will perform a cesarean delivery and the baby was born. And the abruptio was confirmed, as you can see here. And what can we learn from this case? First, that we faced a ratio that is high. We have time to educate the patient in the signs and symptoms that may alert her. And of course, if we are not in a tertiary hospital, we should assure tertiary hospital surveillance for this patient because she is going to develop a complication and probably an early complication. Then, if the ratio is uh, increasing, maybe we can uh, give the corticoids for fetal maturation. And then, if we have very high value of the ratio, we can support our clinical suspicion that it's not so easy to the, decide to indicate a cesarean section only for uh, an ultrasound suspicion of abrusion. And hopefully everything was okay and the baby is alive and well. The last uh, case is to illustrate what happens when we face very high ratios about the scale of 655 that has been uh, previously introduced by my colleague in the previous presentation. Our experience is that uh, we face more uh, maternal complications, but also we see a rapid progression of fetal road restriction from anterograde to reverse umbilical artery in less than seven days when we had the ratio and we had no maternal complications. So this is a case also she had a uh, fetal road restriction at 24 weeks in the previous pregnancy. Uh, I'm going to pass the videos, but uh, believe me that the uterine arteries were very high in, in this pregnancy and also in the next pregnancy at, uh, two years later. And what we saw in the, when we measured the ratio, let's see, we can pass to the, uh, I just want to show you directly the results of the ratio. Well, you can see the uterine arteries were also high even uh, with, uh, with aspirin. In the first pregnancy, it was only a fetal row restriction. The ratio were, were high, but not so high. In, this, in the next pregnancy, ratios were high, but uh, 
fetal growth restriction only appears at 27 weeks, and they were quite stable. But at 31 weeks, more or less, the ratio increased rapidly. And she had a preeclampsia. It was not a severe preeclampsia, but what we saw were um, changes in the Doppler of very rapid progression in the fetus. And let me show you the video, the change in the aortic isthmus. Uh, it changed in only two days from anterograde to uh, reverse. And we didn't show uh, reverse umbilical artery, but with this data, 32 weeks and the previous uh, antecedent, we decided to deliver. And hopefully everything was also okay in the case. Just one minute to show you the video with the changes in the Arctic isthmus that appears in only two days. It changes from anterior grade to reverse. And the umbilical artery also increased their resistances, although it was not reversed. And you can see it's only two days or three days later, and you can see the reverse aortic isthmus. That means that they have a brain sparing. And everything was fine with this patient and with the baby, hopefully. So, my take-off messages when the video stops. Are that the current gold standard for preeclampsia diagnosis, sorry, uh, still relies on a specific finding, so um, the split uh, one PLG ratio is useful, an objective tool to rule out or rule in preeclampsia in case of suspicion, and the dynamic information provided by the ratio helps to optimize spectrum management of preeclampsia and other placental insufficiency-related disorders. Thank you very much. For this interesting presentation, it's always extremely useful to see real clinical cases and to see how we can um, use as a ratio. I think what was also very interesting was to show that sometimes the ratio can be also useful to reassure women that have a, a past experience of preeclampsia and uh, with the ratio, you can, um, I would say, reassure that they will not face uh, a, a subsequent uh, event of preeclampsia. So I think it's uh, it's really impressive. Thanks a lot for this uh, nice presentation. And now I am going to um, present and introduce our last speaker, uh, Roman Kapustin. Uh, so, Roman Kapustin is a physician and senior researcher at the Maternal Fetal Division in the Department of Obstetric, as well as the Scientific Secretary of the uh, Haute Research Institute of Obstetric, Gynecology and Reproductive Medicine in St. Petersburg, Russia. Uh, Roman Kapustin is one of the experts in high-risk uh, pregnancy problems and an invited speaker in domestic and international scientific forums. He received an award for the young researcher for the best scientific work uh, in obstetric and gynecology field in 2014 in St. Petersburg. And in 2016, he was noted for the excellent uh, case presentation of the OME uh, Salzburg Wade Cornell Seminar in obstetric and gynecology. Uh, so Roman Kapustin is the vice president of Warthog, so the branch of Figo, and is uh, the author of uh, many articles and papers with high rank journal. 
So I'm happy to introduce Roman and his talk today will be about the clinical value of uh, preeclampsia biomarker in iris pregnancy and he will also uh, show us some case reports. Thank you for your kind introduction. And I'm, ve I'm very proud to be here and present my report, Clinical Value of Preeclampsia Biomarkers in Iris Pregnancies Case Reports. I have a follow following potential conflicts of interest to report. This lecture is for Termax Fisher Scientific Company. Uh, let's start from a definition of high risk pregnancy. According to Canadian National Institute, healthcare provides user term high risk pregnancy to describe a situation in which a mother has fetus or both at high risk of the problems during pregnancy or delivery than in a typical pregnancy. A high-risk pregnancy may be one that involves chronic health problems such as diabetes or high blood pressure, infections, complications from a previous pregnancy, and all the issues that might arise during pregnancy. It is well established that a number of maternal risk factors are associated with the development of preeclampsia, such as maternal age, Authority, previous history of preeclampsia, pregnancy interval, assisted reproduction, family history of preeclampsia, obesity, race and ethnicity, and comorbidities. These risk factors have been described by various professional organizations for the identification of women at risk of preeclampsia. There are certain medical conditions that predispose women to development preeclampsia. This includes hyperglycemia in pregnancy, pre-pregnancy type 1 and 2 diabetes mellitus, pre-existing chronic hypertension, renal disease and autoimmune uh, disease such as systemic lupus erythematosus and antiphospholipid syndrome. Patients with a history of chronic hypertension have a higher risk of developing preeclampsia than those without this condition with relative risk 5.4. Pre-existing diabetes mellitus, APS, and SLE, and chronic kidney disease are also associated with an increased risk of developing preeclampsia, and you could see the relative risk of risk complications. Uh, you could see a competitive risk model in pregnancies at low risk for preeclampsia, the gestational and distribution is shifted to the right, and in most pregnancies, delivery will occur before the development of preeclampsia. In pregnancies at a higher risk for preeclampsia, the distribution is shifted to the left, the risk of preeclampsia occurring at or before a specified gestational age is given by the area under the distribution curve. As an illustration, in the low risk group, the risk of preeclampsia at less than 34 weeks of gestation is 1% and the high risk group risk uh, is 60%. I would like to present three case reports from my own practice of patient management with pregestational comorbid complications, such as an antiphospholipid syndrome, type 1 diabetes mellitus, and chronic hypertension. So the case number one is an antiphospholipid syndrome. And you can see patient N, gravity 3, priority 0, 37 years old, she has an antiphospholipid syndrome, which has been detected in 2020, based on the clinical data, recurrent pregnancy loss, and details of the laboratory investigations, a high level of anticordiolipid antibodies. According to risk assessment for preeclampsia, which has been included maternal history plus mean arterial pressure, uterine artery, pulsatility index, and the level of PLGF, a high risk for the development of preeclampsia has been determined. Unfortunately, a patient refused the administration of aspirin and taken on the low molecular weight hypothesis. During the second screen ultrasound examination, the paid intention that the measurements of fetal structure are close to the 10th percentile. We recommended a follow-up and ultrasound examinations in three weeks. In 24 weeks, the estimated fetal weight was on the 10th percentile. And the Doppler assessment revealed that in general, pulsatility indexes in the umbilical artery and medial cerebral artery were normal, but uterine artery pulsatility index was more than 95 percentile. 
but zero placental ratio was normal. Taking into account a normal velocity waves according to the Doppler biometry and estimated fetal weight close to 10 percentile, it was seems that the diagnosis was small gestational weight, and we decided to repeat evaluation in two weeks. In 27 weeks, we detected that abdominal circumference and estimated fetal weight were in 5 percentile and uterine artery positivity index was more than 95 percentile, CRP normal, ductus venosus IV positive, and amniotic fluid was normal. A diagnosis fetal growth restriction was set up, and uh, a woman was admitted at the institute with performed RDS prophylaxis, infusion of magnesium, uh, computer CTG, Doppler assessment, and as till TPLG evaluation. You could see a normal range of CCTG and extremely high level of a split PLGF concentration, and of course, we suspected a preeclampsia. On the next week, clinical signs of early onset preeclampsia with high blood pressure and high level of 24 hours proteinuria. Additionally, we detected reverse ductus venosus A wave, and based on these findings, an emergency C section has been performed. A very preterm girl was born with Abgar score 3 to 6 and moved to Nikon. The next clinical case report is devoted to the type 1 diabetes. And you can see patient with Bravo 1, 30 years old. She has a type 1 diabetes mellitus with diabetic nephropathy from 20, uh, 2007 and microalbumin urea. According to risk assessment for preeclampsia, a high risk for the development of this uh, disease has been determined. The patient accepted the administration of aspirin. In 28 weeks, we detected uh, an evaluation of blood pressure, 24 hours proteinuria, 0.8, swollen feet and legs, and platelets and liver function were normal. We figure out what that was, either early onset preeclampsia or gestational hypertension and edema. And a woman was admitted at the institute, and we performed a prophylaxis, infusion magnesium, CCTG, doctor assessment, and a split PLGR evaluation. And you could see a normal value of split PLGR, so we considered that it was gestational hypertension and edema, and we decided to perform a routine management and follow up. And now thought was the deterioration of kidney function uh, due to uh, pregestational diabetic nephropathy. In 32 weeks, a blood pressure was normal and the level of proteinuria was appro approximately one gram, but a split pill of ratio was less than 85, and we decided to proceed our routine management. And in 30 37 weeks, the clinical situation was the same and take into account type 1 diabetes mellitus plus gestational hypertension, we decided to perform induction of labor a healthy term boy was born, so the case is finished without any complications. And the last case is about chronic hypertension. And you could see patient round one, uh, 36 years old. She has a chronic hypertension from 2018. And according to risk assessment for preeclampsia, which has been included maternal history, plus mean arterial pressure, and uterine arterial pulsatility index, and of course the level of PLGF, a high risk for the development of this disease has been determined. A patient accepted the administration of aspirin 150 milligrams. And in 33 weeks during obstetrical examination, we detected the delay of fundus of uterus. And the ultrasound examination revealed the size of abdominal circumference uh, is Three percentile estimated fetal weight was three percentile. Parameters of Doppler and CCTG were, nor were normal. Alongside ultrasound changes, suspicion signs of preeclampsia, increased blood pressure, mild proteinuria, and edema. We performed the evaluation as split PLG of ratio, and it was far from normal. And taking into account these changes, a woman was, a woman was admitted at institute, and we performed. Um, RDS prophylaxis, infusion of magnesium, and assessment of this patient. 
after two weeks, in spite of treatment, the clinical situation was getting worse. And you can see high blood pressure, the level of proteinuria was more than five grams per liter, and general swollens. The level of split pressure ratio was doubled. Pulsatility index in umbilical artery was more than 95 percentile, and due to severe preeclampsia and emergency C-section has been performed, a preterm small gestational age boy was born. And you can see that the practice of split pill geopresia for the prediction of preeclampsia and management of women with this complication is recommended in many countries. And 2020 Russian Association of OBGYN has accepted this policy and recommended in a routine practice. And the conclusion, the clinical presentation of preeclampsia is diverse and the diagnosis of its atopical cases is a daily challenge for the obstetricians. The sleep pill ratio has been shown to have a strong predictive and diagnostic value for preeclampsia. The data presented highlight the value of sleep pill GFMNASA ratio in ruling out preeclampsia in women with high risk pregnancy cohort. Improved triage of pre patients with suspected preeclampsia will ensure appropriate treatment and reduce unnecessary hospitalization. The split PLGF ratio will hopefully be included among the criteria to diagnose preeclampsia and became, uh, become incorporated into more and more clinical protocols guiding the diagnosis and managing of this preeclampsia. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Roman, uh, for uh, this uh, very good presentation. So again, some other clinical cases of high-risk pregnancy and how we can use the ratio to uh, stratify this, this woman and to um, add to identify the one that will develop a severe feature. So thanks to all our speakers, it was um, a very informative and very practical session uh, because we really got um, the insight from the clinical research, uh, so from the clinical practice and not research studies, so really uh, routine uh, practice. So uh, we are going to start our Q&A session. So I uh, encourage the audience to um, send uh, questions uh, through the Q&A uh, tool. So please uh, do not hesitate to ask questions to our speakers. Uh, they will be, uh, I'm sure, more than happy to answer to all your uh, questions. And um, we are going, uh, oh yes, so we have a first general question and uh, I think I can start by answering this one. So we have some question uh, if the slides will be available after the event. Uh, so we want to uh, inform everyone that the recording uh, of the, uh, of the uh, event is will be available after the presentation uh, so you will all receive a link and you have the possibility to access to the on-demand webinar afterward okay so uh let's start uh with the question and i have one question from uh, so it's my question <laughs> from your presentation, Roman. Um, I saw that your first case, you said that you implement a preeclampsia screening in first trimester, that you identified that the first case, the woman was at risk of developing preeclampsia. You proposed aspirin and she refused. So can you, I mean, do you have any uh, information of why she refused to take aspirin and preferred to take some uh, low molecular weight heparin? Thank you for your question. Yes, uh, she was my patient and she has an antiphospholipid syndrome. And according to our guidelines, inter international recommendations, uh, women with antiphospholipid anti syndrome is recommended to administrate and low molecular hyperens and aspirin alongside during the all gestational process. Uh, but, but to be honest, I don't know why she refused to uh, to take uh, aspirin during the pregnancy maybe according to uh, according to she was afraid about some side effects of aspirin because uh, she has heard about some congenital anomalies due to administration of aspirin 
and she just only refused. Uh, aspirin, uh, and it was very pity because I have shown uh, the outcome of this patient, and maybe the administration of aspirin might improve the outcome for this patient, especially in severe disease such as antiphospholipid syndrome. Yeah, for sure. So yes, it, it's clear that this um, administration of aspirin, especially for this high-risk patient uh, here, would have been probably beneficial. Uh, thanks for, for your answer. Okay, so now, and this is a question to all our speakers. Um, so what was the key point that persuaded you to implement SFIT and PHGF ratio in clinical routine? So of course we know that there were a high number of studies uh, in the past on the ratio. And one day you have to decide whether you want to start in routine uh, with the ratio. And uh, so to all the speakers, so what was the key point that uh, decided you to, uh, to really implement it in clinical routine in your institution? Yeah, maybe Once I can start, start Pascaline. Yes. Yeah. Um, so from the perspective uh, in Denmark, um, I think um, when we do biomarker studies, of course, we always look for markers that have a very high discriminative potential. Um, but essentially, um, what we ultimately want is biomarkers that change clinical routine, change decision making, because otherwise, uh, so we want m markers in our laboratory that the clinician uh, use as not nice to have, but need to have. And um, <clears throat> in that perspective, I think that the SFLIT PLGF ratio and all the um, uh, all the scientific evidence, clinical evidence, uh, has supported exactly that. Uh, and then also there's an uh, in a economical benefit um, to save for specializations. There's been some papers out there on that too. So. Um, so in our case, uh, we, we thought that uh, there was just too much of good evidence um, to support, to implement it. Thank you. And Maybe Paul, you can yeah. also comment here. Of course, and in Toulouse, we really wanted to improve the management of women at high risk of preeclampsia, you know, with, with or without suspicion of uh, preeclampsia, but all of these women at high risk, we, we really don't know how to manage it before uh, the diagnosis of preeclampsia and without inducing too much hospitalization. So in this indication, the negative predictive value of the ratio for the diagnosis is really excellent. And I think it's maybe the first key point to implement uh, the ratio in clinical practice, it's for the negative predictive value in a population of women at high risk of preeclampsia. Okay, thanks. Ma um, so, Roman, Ignacio, maybe also your feedback of why or what was the key point to decide you to use the ratio in clinical routine? Yes, it's yes, very uh, important because. Uh, because the management, the management of uh, women from a high risk cohort uh, is essential, and especially for my institution, because we encountered with women with pregestational type diabetes, and I previously have shown uh, a woman with diabetic nephropathy, and of course it is very difficult to perform some differential diagnosis between. Uh, the deterioration of kidney function, yes, and onset of uh, irregular platelets, yeah. And that's why the additional tool, such as a split PLGF, it's crucial for the management of such patients, uh, especially uh, to reduce uh, uh, unnecessary interventions. Uh, because then you would have got a high level of proteinuria and you understand, okay, this is a high risk of preeclampsia and very, very preterm but, but from the other hand, 
This is just kind of the deterioration of the course of uh, pregestational diabetes, such as uh, diabetic nephropathy. Uh, that's why this is very important and it's very helpful for our staff uh, in the uh, processing of uh, administration of such patients. Thank you. Ignacio? Uh, I agree with my colleagues. I only want to add that these biomarkers um, doesn't substitute the, the clinical evaluation and they are additional tools that give us an objective um, result about what is the, the point of the placental dysfunction and they're very useful to guide our uh, decisions, but they don't substitute the, our clinical evaluation. They are complementary. Yeah. Yes, thanks for your feedback. Yes, for sure. I think it's, it's clearly uh, not only the ratio that can help, it's, it's really the combination of all uh, the parameters. And sometimes it can help for the, depending on the presentation, clinical presentation can help to go in one side or the area or the other. Yeah. Thanks. So I have, we have some questions from the audience, uh, quite some. Um, so I'm going to start and I think that this is uh, also again a kind of general question. So um, when should we start to test S3 to PRGF ratio? So, I mean, first trimester, so I think it's out of scope, more second trimester. And what would be the interval for repeated test? So would it be every month or more often? And here you got also a lot of different cases. So, what is your general um, routine in your institution? I think it depends on the indication of why do you want the ratio results. Uh, of course, it starts; it doesn't start before the second trimester, but it depends if it's a, a suspicion of preeclampsia. So you have to do it when uh, appears the suspicion of clinical uh, preeclampsia, uh, or if it's just for a woman at high risk of preeclampsia with no sign of or symptoms, just to adapt uh, your management. And in this situation, maybe in this setting of uh, suspicion, maybe you, if it's negative, you can do it again, maybe in two weeks or or one if uh, clinical symptoms appears between the dosage and uh, and the results. Thank you. Any comment also from the other speakers? Well, I, I think the indications for performing the ratio are suspicion of preeclampsia before 37 weeks, uh, suspicion or preeclampsia or other uh, placental disease. And uh, our, we have very good results in those cases with uh, high uterine arteries when, or high risk patients. Also, if we had a, a high risk in the first trimester combined screening for preeclampsia, to reassess them at about 26 weeks. Because if the ratio is normal, you can be practically sure that she's not going to develop a preeclampsia of restriction restriction, uh, at least an early form. And Go when ahead. to revaluate, re revaluation depends on the previous value. If the ratio is normal, below 38, we only repeat it if a new suspicion appears. It usually doesn't happen before four weeks. And if we have intermediate values or, or above 38, we repeat it in two weeks. And if the ratio is above 85, we repeat it uh, at least once per week, because we like to follow the course of the disease with the ratio. But of course, it is uh, debated if we should um, perform the ratio when preeclampsia is already diagnosed. But uh, we do so because we think that we go ahead the, the, the disease and the complications we use the ratio. Thank you. Uh... The other speakers, so Roman or Martin, any comment here? It's all about clinical situation, of course. 
if you would suspect women about preeclampsia signs, you have to manage and have to do this test. And the uh, next one will be according to clinical situation. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I, uh, I agree with uh, Roman. I, I agree with Roman. Um, we, uh, we are not doing it. Um, uh, so we are doing it um, for these women that present with symptoms. Um, we're not doing it uh, at least routinely on, on the high risk population. But, um, um, but it seems to be also a very good um, addition uh, to, uh, to reassure those that uh, already had uh, severe preeclampsia for the rule out um, of preeclampsia in the second, as uh, Ignacio um, pointed out. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I know, Paul, that you may have to leave <laughs> for your, uh, because you have another event. So thanks. Uh, and if you can stay a little bit longer, that's great. If not, uh, thanks a lot for your presentation. And it was really uh, very, very interesting and very helpful for the audience. Thanks to you for the invitation. Thank you. Uh, so now I have another question, uh, which is a little bit of a, a controversy, I would say at the moment, it's about the cutoffs. So, and I think that through all your presentation, we saw the very um, large range of cutoff that can be used, uh, depending on the clinical um, indication. Uh, so we saw uh, the cutoff at 38, we know about the cutoff at 85, uh, we know that there is some additional cutoff in the late, um, so for more severity and adverse outcomes, so we got one at 294 that we saw in the presentation, um, one at, so the 655 and all this, and we saw the presentation from Martin for one single um, ruled rule out cutoff. So of course it's, uh, and I can tell you that we have some other question in the, in the chat with uh, what about cutoff for twins? What about uh, cutoff for delivery and, and all this? So what's your opinion here? So uh, what, um, what would you, kind of, of of recommend? What do you think about this cutoff? Do you think that it should be unified? So for example, just like what we have in the screening, should there be a provider assay specific, specific, laboratory specific, or even indication specific? So can you uh, give us some uh, insight on that question? Yes, um, perhaps I can uh, start. Um, so from our perspective, um, it seems that um, at least we need to, uh, to look at uh, which assay we use because there are some differences in the calibration of uh, PLGF and then also uh, the split PLGF ratio. But it seems that the commercial assays um, um, that, that has been published uh, perform um, uh, with very high sensitivity and specificity. Then in terms of um, the different cutoffs, um, I think um, um, in a general setting where many different doctors will use the test, um, there may be some benefits just to have a single cutoff. Um, and then, of course, they know that uh, they can do a, another test uh, if they are in a gray zone, as uh, also Roman pointed out. Um, but for, for the, the specialists that actually know uh, more about the, how to use um, the test, um, of course, the, the information of the gestational age of the woman uh, also uh, is something you should keep in mind because then uh, um, it will be not normal to have like a, um, a, a ratio between like uh, 30 and, and 85 uh, or, or even higher. So it also depends on gestational age. But our j proposal is, is kind of just to, to add into, um, you know, the, the options that, that you can actually 
uh, have, but I think the obstetrician should decide themselves um, how to use it. Uh, okay. I think the thing is that the PLGF with Thermo Fisher, the values are always lower than with Rose. So um, the, the ratios are, are higher with Thermo Fisher. So they are more sensitive, but not so specific, probably. And it sounds well what uh, Martin said. Probably 66 with Thermo Fisher correspond more or less to the 38 with Ross. It's helpful, but I, I think in clinical practice also 38 will work with both platforms, taking into account that maybe it's not so specific with, with Thermo Fisher, but I think it works. The, the cutoffs are orientative. So then with the practice, you can, uh, you can um, interpret better the, the value. And uh, there are also other conditions that you have mentioned, uh, twin pregnancies, uh, pregnancy with uh, previous diseases, that sometimes it is a little bit more difficult to, to, to interpret the ratio. But in preterm pregnancy, it's quite black or white. You have a result of 66, I'm sure she's going to develop uh, a preclampsia of vital restriction with uh, Thermo Fisher or Rose or whenever. And um, I don't have a clear response, but I, I think uh, 38 or 66 will work with both uh, platforms. Roman? Yes, and I would like to add, uh, because this is a very difficult question. And it depends uh, on the test system, what kind of uh, commercial test system do you use in your practice. Uh, but it seems that patients, women with endothelial dysfunction, from my experience, my own experience, endothelial dysfunction, such, a, such as chronic hypertension, pregestational diabetes, etc., cetera, uh, might put in with more lower cutoff when, for instance, eight to five in the second uh, part of pregnancy. Uh, because uh, we performed uh, uh, investigation about the pregestational diabetes, type one and, and type two diabetes, and we detected that cut off for the preeclampsia uh, in this cohort is about 71. And that's why this is very close to the results of Martin, 60C, and between 60C and uh, 85. But anyway, every obstetrician understands that this is the ratio between anti angiogenic and angiogenic factors. And the evaluation and, and, and uh, uh, enhancement of these factors is very dangerous and might uh, describe the dangerous situation and might predict the development of preeclampsia. And that's why I do understand that when we came across with the situation more than into five that has been set up by Roche Diagnostic System, this is uh, very positive predictive, it has a very positive predictive value. And uh, it helps to manage with such SA patients. Uh, but anyway, when the companies, obstetricians, and our investigators would perform a huge population study, not just only 1,000 pregnant women, uh, with pay attention of uh, ethnicity, age, and comorbid diseases, uh, would be more certain controls. This is one of the limitations. This is my okay. point of view. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, we are now out of time. So I would like, so it's really that we have to stop like this, but I really would like to thank our, all our speakers, all the audience, and we receive a lot of questions. So we will forward the question to the speakers by mail and we will uh, send you an uh, answer uh, as soon as we can. So thanks everyone, wish you a wonderful day. and. Uh...
um, hope that we will meet uh, again in the next month. So thank you. We can close the session now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.